Hey, hey. Hey, do y'all still bring your Bible to church? All right, come on, come on. Um, I, wa- I got to tell you something. I wanted so badly to preach the message on the Gospel of John that I have had finished now for uh, several weeks. But as I talk with some of our church leaders, you know, normally when I preach a message, I think you understand this, I study all week, you all come to church, and I preach the message and three times usually, and then it goes in a file, and next week, you guys are like when I grew up uh, with, uh, in a home with four boys, no, no sisters, only brothers, my mom would always say, doesn't matter how good supper is tonight, because they're going to be hungry again very soon. And that's what, it's, that's what it's like to pastor this church. I just make a new message, make a new message, make a new message. But this vertical church message, which is an eight-part series and the 500 hours it took to write the book and then to take it on the road and preach it 40 times, our elders met us in the Quad Cities, the elders' wives met us in Indianapolis, uh, some of the leaders met us in Alaska, um, and, and they would say this to me over and over, that's not the same message you preached at the church. And I'd be like, Really? Like, no, no, that's a completely different message than you preached at the church. And I was like, really? So uh, here's the thing. I, I uh, personally, I, I'm ready to move to the next thing. But I feel in my heart to go out and preach uh, that message to 80,000 people and to come home and feel like the people that we love most uh, aren't really current with me on that. I'm going to just trust the Lord and the wisdom that I've been given and try to serve well and so we're going to go, I'm going to call this message a Vertical Church Reprise, all right? And this gonna, I'm going to put this on the shelf now after today, but the lessons are going forward, but the message is going into retirement, trust me on that. And, uh, but I really want you to know what the Lord's been talking to me. When you take two months and all you think about is one message, one passage, and I'm up uh, every night, every night, every night with that. The Lord's really engraved some of these things on my heart, things I didn't say to you at all back in uh, August. So... If you would open your Bibles with me, please, to Isaiah 64. I'm going to trust the Lord in this. The verse that I want to show you is Isaiah 64, 1. Let me read it to you. Uh, It says this. um, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence. Now, Uh, This message is going out, as you know, to all of our campuses, and I've heard that while I've been gone, uh, we have uh, started a Saturday night service in uh, Aurora, and we've moved the North Shore campus down to our cathedral, so a lot of great, uh, we've dedicated the worship center here, so a lot of great things have been happening, and uh, whatever campus you're on, uh, right now, as I love to say, it doesn't matter where I am, it just matters where you are and where your Bible is, so let's all get our eyes one more time on that verse, Isaiah 64, 1. Oh, that that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake in your presence. Hey, will you underline that in your Bible? We do that for me. We underline that in your Bible and maybe just put VC or vertical. Just put something there to remind all of us what that means to us. And I'm going to come back to that in just a second. But um, let me just remind you, uh, people are like, what did you go on that tour for, man? You've been gone a long time. And why'd you do that? I'm here first, not because it was fun, okay? There were some fun moments, but it was arduous and exhausting, and the spiritual warfare was massive. And, and uh, uh, here today I can say that I am uh, a weary in body and strong in spirit uh, due to your uh, prayers. But the main reason why we went out and did this and spent ourselves doing it is because of the first thing in your notes today, and that is because the church in America is in trouble, okay? Do you, you, it's probably difficult for you to even understand uh, the condition of the church in America. Most of y'all don't go to other churches, maybe only when you're out of town or something. And uh, this summer, Kathy and I, isn't it great to see her doing good, and the Lord's been so gracious to us. And I mean, she makes it, amen, she, now come on, either we're gonna clap or we aren't. Is this a clap time? All right, all right, all right. This Harvest Bible chap, we don't even know crap clapping here, okay? Either we're doing it or we're not doing it. Now, um, she, she makes it sound like it's nothing, right? I mean, that machine almost flipped over on top of her. It was rolling down a 45-degree angle toward her. And, you know, I cracked some bones. She broke six ribs, uh, two of them in two places, and her arm and her wrist. 
and I cracked my arm. Oh my goodness. She's a wonderful, wonderful, I adore that woman. I, we've been married 29 years and I still have a hot happening, lump in my throat, sweaty palm, can't wait to be with her marriage, all right? And, but here's the thing, here's the thing, if you, if, here's the thing, if you have, uh, and it's, it's, not a, it's not a right to have a good marriage, it's a privilege. No, not the women, the men, I gave you a softball right there, yo. It's, it's a privilege to have a marriage. Amen. Lift up your voice, boys, because she's going to remember how loud you were the rest of the day. <laughs> it's a privilege to have a great marriage. Amen. Amen. All right, all right. Now, so, but here's the thing. If you have it, if you have it, it's easy to forget that it, that, that, that didn't come as easily to a lot of people. There's people that wish they were married and there aren't. There's people that wish they were married again because they wish they could take the lessons they learned. And there's people that are struggling in the marriage that they're in. If you have something, it's so easy to lose sight of what it's like for people who don't have it. And if you have a church, our church is a good church. It's a God church. It's not a perfect church. Turn and say that to your neighbor. Tell them. All right? But it's a growing church, and I don't even mean growing numerically, though I think that is happening. I'm talking as a growing group of people. I'm growing, you're growing, we're growing, God's working on us. If you, if you attend a good church, a vertical church, a Christ-adoring, word-proclaiming, gospel-saturated, uh, God is working, how about that story this morning? I mean, could you do that? I can't do that. God did that. God did that for them. He just took them down. He's like, you're coming with me. And I mean, they, they didn't earn it. They didn't deserve it. He just took them to the mat with the full weight of who he is. And we got stories like that going on in our church all the time. And, and we're blessed. Everyone say it. And if you have something, you can lose sight of what it's like to not have it. But I don't have that luxury. I travel. I see and this is happening on our watch. The church in America is in big trouble. And I don't mean we're having a bad quarter, okay? Uh, the church in America is just those statistics again. Uh, 6,000 churches in America are closing their doors uh, every year. 6,000. Kathy and I were, not Kathy and I, some of the elders and I were on the south side of Chicago back in the spring. And we walked through a big four-story stone cathedral with 1,200 seats and beautiful stained glass and 85,000 square feet of ministry space. But the place stunk inside uh, because the roof leaked and the carpets were mildewed and the doors were padlocked and there was a for sale sign out front. What happened here? It's hard for us to even imagine that, but imagine this. Imagine on whatever campus uh, you're worshiping on at Harvest today, imagine that there's a for sale sign outside of our church. I mean, there has to be a story there. What happened here? What happened here? This used to be a place filled with the glory of God and the word of God, and it's, it's dead now. This church we were in was padlocked. Apparently a lock wasn't needed to keep the people out. And that's happening 6,000 times a year. When we were in St. Louis on this tour, uh, in one two-mile stretch along the road, Kathy and I saw four, four churches for sale. Now some of you who are a little older, you know, you never used to see that. I mean, you'd never see a church for sale. Now it's everywhere. Go, go look up a Chicago churches for sale online. Page after page after page, okay? The church in America is in a free fall, okay? And, and within a generation, we're going to be the church in Western Europe if something doesn't change, okay? And, and uh, you know what the church in Western Europe's like, right? Do you know? I mean, all the churches, really hardly, there's a few, but there's hardly any gospel preaching churches there. Mostly they've been turned into bingos and brothels and bars and paved. The only churches left in Western Europe, for the most part, are the biggest ones that, that uh, dopey Americans go over and pay money to tour. Hands up if you're one of those dopey Americans who's toured a cathedral in Europe. All right, thank you for dopey Americans, right? And, 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 and. And, and, you, and Americans walk through these big cathedrals in Europe and they're like, this is beautiful. No, it's dead is what it is. The church in Western Europe is dead and that's the church that we're going to give to our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren if something drastic doesn't change, okay? That's the way it really is. 3,500 Americans are leaving the church every day, every day. 
And I don't mean I'm going to a different church. I mean I am done with infighting, backbiting, heartbreaking, frustrating church. I don't need it. I still have some affection for Jesus, but I go over to that building and I feel like I'm further from God than I was when I went there. It's not helping me. And most of what's going on in so many churches that do still meet is this Western world, watered down, hyper-therapeutic, hardly better than Dr. Phil church. You know, where you get helpful little tips and three ways to communicate with your adolescent and, and uh, four ways to balance your checkbook and all this horizontal helpfulness, but it's not about God. And you don't hear from God. And people aren't meeting with God. And people aren't being confronted by the pride-withering presence of God. And church is supposed to be an earth-shattering, window-rattling, life-altering encounter with the God of the universe. That's what church is supposed to be. Amen. Amen. See, churches don't die. God's voice in them dies. That's what happens. And when churches become places that God isn't heard from, they're just buildings then. They're, they're not special. They're not awesome. And, and uh, sadly, most pastors that try to even solve that problem uh, spend most of their energy on competency things, how to, you know, they go to conferences. I've, been to so many, I've spoken at so many church conferences, and most of them are about, you know, how to build a small group, how to reach new people, how to penetrate your culture, how to plan a service, how to have a building campaign, how to lead your, how to, how to, how to, how to, eh. The church in America is choking on how. Our problem's not a how problem, it's a who problem. And the who problem is, is that honestly, God just doesn't attend most churches in America. He flat out doesn't attend. I was talking to a friend of mine who pastors a large church recently, and he was telling me the crazy things he was doing to try to reach people. And I was like, dude, that's awful, man. That's blasphemous what you're doing. And he's like, oh, the people weren't offended. I said, God is offended. God is offended by what you're doing. All right? And God stands off on the church in America and goes, you think that's great? You think that's better than me? You, you think you could, you, this is, you're good with all this helpfulness? You know, have it, choke on it. And that's what's happening. And uh, you say, well, James, you really think you're... 40 city, you really think you're going to change that? No, no, I don't think that at all, actually. What I think is I want to do something. I want to do something. I don't want us to be a selfish little cloistered group of people that are so about ourselves and what we want every week that we don't have a heart for the church of Jesus Christ in America and in the world. And I'm very thankful, by the way, that's not a reproof in any way. I am so thankful to God for a group of people that we call our Harvest family who have stood behind us and prayed for us and supported this and, and done some things a little bit differently for a few weeks and released us to be obedient to what we believe God called us to do. And because uh, it's desperately needed, the church in America is in big trouble. And then I jot this down. I love this thought, and it has really grown in my heart these last few weeks. Uh, only God moves mountains. Only God moves mountains. Look at that verse again with me, will you? Isaiah 64 1. I don't think I'm ever going to get tired of this verse. Oh, that you would rent. Now, we believe that God wrote the Bible, right? Amen? Amen. I understand. I've been away. You, always, you encourage the preacher now. We believe that God wrote the Bible. Amen? Amen? Right. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, so every word matters. And if every word matters, what do you suppose the first word I want to talk about in Isaiah 64, 1? Oh, right? Now, um, there's a lot of different ways you can use the word oh. But as I think I did point out, uh, this, is, this is passion. He, he's not like, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. He's not like, oh, that you would rend the, it's not like that. He's like, oh, that you, and if that seems loud to you, if that seems like too intense to you, God's going to get you to the place in your life where you're going to pray like that. I'm telling you it's coming because I've been there. I always knew how to pray on my knees, but I've seen my tears Falling on the carpet this far from my face. And I'll tell you, when you begin to cry out to the Lord, I'm telling you, there's just, there's nothing like that. 
And, and, and that's what he, Isaiah's at the end of his ministry. He's like, I've tried everything to see these, these people turn. And he's so desperate, he turns to the Lord. Uh, two chapters here to go in the book of Isaiah. And he's just desperate. And he cries out from his heart with passion. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Now, honestly, we need that kind of passion a little more in church. Can I just say that? And, and, and I love you, and I've thought about you a lot while I've been away, because you are a very, very lively, active, into it crowd from the first note to the last amen here at Harvest. But just because uh, we are maybe got a little higher watermark than some of the places we've been, um, I don't want us to be content where we are. And, and it, it grieves me that, that uh, some uh, people will, you know, you're, you're, you come to church and you're kind of tucked in, you know, and well, you know, it's, it's just, I don't want to get carried away. But then somebody says, let's go to the Bears game. And you're like, I'm going to paint myself, you know. And, <laughs> and, and I think that's wrong. I think that everyone say it's wrong. It's wrong, loved ones. Our greatest expressions of passion should be for Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. That should be your high water mark. Okay? And, and uh, I understand that we're all different. I understand that the kid who grew up in Iceland isn't going to be as fired up as our Latin American sister. And I understand that the guy from Norway isn't going to quite get it going like my African American brother. I get that. Okay? God just wants you to redline who you are. Clear? He wants you to come to church every weekend and reach down for the dial of who he made you to be and crank it on full, okay? And I, I get the feedback, well, you sure crank it on full. I, I, don't, I don't like it that much when you raise your voice and stuff. Really? Well, this is not going to be a good place for you then. <laughs> because um, one of my favorite preachers, Martin Lloyd-Jones, uh, who preached for many, many years in London, England, one of the greatest preachers of the last century, he said this. He said, a theology, a preaching is theology coming through a man who is on fire. And he said, a man who can speak dispassionately about these things has no right to be in a Christian pulpit and should never be allowed to enter there. All right? Think about what we're talking about. Of course we're passionate about these things. Of, and that's what he's calling for here. Anyway, all of that from the word O. Oh. <laughs> all right? These, some, of these, some of these tour events were pretty long. Um, then check this. Oh, that you would rend the heavens. And he's describing the heavens as the barrier between us and God. It's poetic. It's not the cumulus cloud problem. It's not a stars and planets problem. But there is a problem. He's referring to it as the heavens, but it's poetic. I'm going to tell you in a minute what the problem is, but let's just acknowledge together. Do you ever, how many people here ever pray a prayer and you think to yourself after you say amen, boy? I don't know if that heart even got out of the room. How many of you ever feel like that? Put up your hand if you feel like there's a barrier sometimes. How many of you sometimes sit in church and for whatever reason, maybe it's you, maybe it's the preacher, maybe it's the occasion, but how many people have ever felt like, yeah, this is just not happening right now? See, there is a barrier. There is a barrier, okay? And, that key, and, and look at, and, and it's not God. God is not reluctant. God is not reticent. God is not unwilling. Listen to me. God is this moment ready to do all that we long to see him do. The delay is related to what you see in the mirror and what you see around you. God, as I've often said, God is making us spiritually fit to receive what he's already willing to do. Maybe it's not quite the right moment. Maybe he hasn't purified my motives yet, right? And I pray for healing because I want a longer life when I should pray so that I would be less selfish and use whatever days I have to honor him. I pray for my prodigal child to come home because I want to sleep better at night instead of because I'm grieved by the heartache that they're causing themselves. I, I pray for my uh, financial situation to change or for God to give me a job, but in reality, I haven't even repented of the terrible decisions I made that got me in this position. See, do you see? Do you see? God is not reluctant. He is not unwilling. He is not unable. And today we build whole theologies that defend God's inactivity. 
and they distort the beautiful doctrine of God's sovereignty and make it like into God doesn't, he just doesn't want to do much anymore, I guess. I guess he just doesn't want to do much anymore. Really? God forgive us for acting like somehow he's not on it and we are. No, no, he's working to get us on it so he can be. You're going to see that in the text here. Oh, that you would rend this barrier, whatever it is, and come down that the mountains, see that there, see mountains? I didn't even mention this in August and when I preached this passage to you and people have been asking me, um, you know, what's your favorite part of this message you've been preaching over and over and over and over and over and over and over? I said, well, my favorite part, honestly, is this part about the mountains. Because, again, this is a metaphor. Do you remember your English class? Remember English class? A metaphor, a comparison without using like or as. So this isn't a verse about how to make mountains quake. It's not a verse about how to make mountains move. It's a verse about how to make something move that's like a mountain. It's a metaphor. So let's think about mountains for a minute. Um, Not a lot of mountains in Chicago, agreed? We're flatlanders here, but how many people have actually been to a for real snow on top in the summertime mountain? Put up your hand if you've been to one of those. I'm not talking about those, all those people in North Carolina, they think they got mountains over. That ain't no mountain. All right? I'm talking snow on top in the summertime. Now, when you stand at the base of a mountain, everybody call out the answer together. Ready? When you stand at the base of a mountain, what do you feel? Small. Correct. You feel small. Mountains make you feel small and not ticked off small. Not like, not like, why am I so short? <laughs> right? Because it's so massively above you, and you know that even if you had like your buddy there who was like 6'8 or something, he, he'd feel the same thing. He would also feel, tell me, he feels small. So mountains make everyone, everyone, they're the great reducer. They make everyone feel small. Second thing a mountain makes you, you look at a mountain, you stand there and you look at it for a while, and you're like, um, yeah, that's been there for a long time. I've, that's been there for a long time. I think that was there before Columbus, you know? And, and, and uh, how long have the mountains been there? Well, the scripture says, get this, the scripture says that before the mountains were brought forth, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. In other words, the one thing in all the universe the mount, uh, that, the, that the scriptures roll out to describe God's eternality, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, eternally existing in three persons, they, they, they're like, like mountains, because when you look at a mountain, you're like, that's been there for a long time, and it's going to be there till whoever put it there comes for it, right? And, and so now put those two things together. Mountains make you feel small. Uh, mountains make you feel like, uh, like they're permanent, like they're, they're, they're unchanging, like this is always going to be this way. Now look at Isaiah 64, 1. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down that the, say it, that the mountains. Now, this is not a mountain verse. It's a things that make me feel small that I think can never change verse. And I have so missed you and missed loving on you and pastoring you and teaching you, which is the great joy and privilege of my life. And I'm so excited to be back to this now for, for many, many weeks to come, God willing. And, and I know that a lot of you have come in here today and you've got mountains in your life. I get that. And, and you, would, you would say, well, you know, we always used to be able to handle stuff, and we could always get on top of things, and somehow we found a way to get through it. But now we're facing something. It's just, it makes us feel so small. And, and, and we, I, I feel like it's never going to, I'm always going to feel alone in my marriage. And, 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 and our, our, our daughter's always going to break our heart. And, and I'm never going to get over this chronic pain. And, 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 and I'm, I'm so lost and alone. And, 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 and I lost my, some family, I lost profound loss. And I just can't get over it. And, I, and I'm stuck. And this big thing in front of me has made me feel so small. And, and I feel like it's never going to change. So now you know what he's praying about. And now you know why he's so passionate. And that's why he says... Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. That this thing that makes me feel so small that I think will never change would quake 
See, rend the heavens is not a request for improvement over the next several months. He's saying, tear it apart, God. Get the barrier out of the way and come and, and see, Jesus said the same thing. He said, if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it'll be done for you. If you're facing something that makes you feel small, that is not God's will for your life, that, that, uh, that uh, you think can never change, see, now this is probably the most important sentence in the message, all right, and I already had you say, write it down if you haven't already, only God moves mountains, okay, only God moves mountains, and church is supposed to be the place where mountains move, you get that? That's the message that we took to all these people, church is supposed to be the place where mountains move, okay, and, and uh, as we've been experiencing, if mountains move, we, we, mountains are moving here, Marriages are getting healed, lost people are getting found, uh, lonely people are finding fellowship, uh, uh, um, uh, sick people are finding healing, um, addicted people are finding freedom, and, and, and uh, if that hasn't got to you yet, you need to lean forward, because that's going on here every week. And, and, and look, when, when church becomes a place where mountains move, you spend a lot of your time trying to figure out how to get more chairs, because not so much out there. And if you're here today and you have a mountain, you're in the right place. And might I just add that uh, God is actually in the business of putting mountains uh, in our life. And God allows, because you're like, well, I hate feeling small. Well, God likes that you know how small you are. And, and well, I, I hate having to pray like, and turn to the Lord like this. Well, he loves it. And, and, and God is using that mountain, do you see, in your life to change you and to make you into what he wants you to be. And none of us enjoy it for the moment, but afterwards the scripture says it yields the peaceable fruits of righteousness to those who are trained by it. So last part of the verse, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence. And this is probably the key distinction. The presence part here is... Um, well, if you've been listening carefully to what I've been saying, you might be thinking to yourself, well, what are you talking about presence, James? God coming down, God not coming to some churches. I, I'm surprised that you, I thought you went to seminary. Like, didn't, didn't, didn't your mom teach you about omnipresence? How many people have heard of omnipresence? Okay, well, that's the biblical, a lot of people have heard this, and that's the biblical idea in some people's minds uh, that God is everywhere. And depending on the kind of teaching you've been getting, you may have heard this before, that God is everywhere, and preachers are so fond of saying this, God is everywhere, he's everywhere, he's everywhere, he's everywhere. Really? Really is he? Is he everywhere? Are you sure about that? Could you prove that from the scriptures? Are you so sure? God is everywhere, really is he? Is he under the stage right now? He's out in your car waiting for you. He's everywhere. And I know that a lot of people believe this. Um, and it's fine, it's fine. How many people here this morning, put your hand up and say, I believe God is everywhere. Okay, how many, how many of you are like, well, I would have put my hand up, but you're confusing me. <laughs> put up your hand if that's you. Okay, good. Good, good, because I wanted you to think about this. Um, so, first of all, to be very clear, God is everywhere. Without, I mean, really, do you, <laughs> really, do you know your Bible? David said, if I go into uh, heaven, you're there. If I descend into the lower parts of the earth, David said, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and go to the uttermost parts of the earth, even there your right hand will uphold me. The scripture says, I am the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth? See? And, and so God is everywhere. Don't send me no letters. Okay, I, I did clear that up. I was like, I knew he was going to get ruined on that bus tour. No, no. <laughs> God is everywhere for sure. Absolutely. Say it again. Say it. All right, but the wonderful truth of God's omnipresence has caused us to assume something that is not true. And while it is true that God is everywhere, it is not true that God is working equally everywhere. He's not. And there are many places, I believe, where God's not working much. And there are some places where God's not working at all. That's why we pray in the Lord's Prayer. You know the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Remember the next part? Your kingdom come, and then what? Your on as it, as it is in heaven, on earth as it is, in, and even in the prayer that Jesus gave us, we're acknowledging that some places things happen precisely as God wants, on time, every time, and other places, not so much. And we long for the day that the scripture talks about where the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the water, waters cover the sea. 
and, and someday uh, uh, his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But would you agree, not today? If you agree, say not today. Not today, not today. Not today. you know. And I know that God's sovereign over things that happen uh, that um, are wrong, sinful things that happen. I know God can cause all things to work together for the good of those who love him. But uh, that doesn't change the reality that in a broken world, okay, things are not happening on earth as they are in heaven. And God is not working equally everywhere. For example, that's why he says, draw near to me. Do you know this part? Draw near to me and I will draw near to you. Now, if you're reading that in the scriptures, you would never, God's inviting you to pray and repent and dig into his word and, and do the things that draw near to him. And you'd never hear that. And God would say, draw near to me. And you'd say, well, why, why would I? You're everywhere. Obviously, in that, he's promising, though he is everywhere, he's promising to manifest himself more powerfully in the life of the person that draws near to him. Is that clear? Just like it says in Psalm 34, 17, it says, I love this verse. I preached this Psalm 34 here a few years ago, and this verse is very dear to Kathy and me. It says, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. Think about it. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. Some people here today are on one of our campuses. You have a broken heart. And you wonder, well, where is God? And the scripture says he's near to you. And you say, well, I don't feel it. I, I can't feel it. I, I can't see it. Right, right. But it's true. Regardless of your senses. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. So though he is everywhere, there is a way that he is working more powerfully in the life of the person who is brokenhearted today. Now, um, that's what it means when it says, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down that the mountains might quake at your presence. What we're longing for is we're longing for church to be, our church, lift up your voice and say our church. We're longing for our church to be increasingly. I'm not satisfied. I don't think our best days are in the rearview mirror. I think everything we've been to this point is preparation for what God wants to do next. I don't look at that book, Vertical Church, and think, wow, we got 100 out of 100 in this. Not at all. I think we have so much room to grow, and I believe that God is willing to do so much more. Everyone say more. More than what he's already doing. I believe that he's willing to do that. But we've got to deal with that the heavens that need to be rended, what's in the way. And I want to talk about what's in the way by having you turn your Bible uh, in the remaining time. Uh, let's go over to um, Exodus, Exodus 32 and 33. While you're turning there, let me remind you um, where this is in God's word. Um, Exodus 32 and 33 is Moses leading the children of Israel from Egypt to the promised land. And they're kind of about halfway at Mount Sinai there, and, and the journey's well underway at least. And um, hey, I don't want to spend a ton of time on this. How many people think that they could get like a C on the Moses test? Put up your hand if you think you could get like C on Moses. Some of you think you could, some of you are looking down. He'll call me up there. Would you, don't put your hand up, he'll call you right up. <laughs> so, so, okay, well, um, quick review. Uh, Moses uh, was uh, called to lead God's people, two million Hebrews who were slaves in Egypt. Can you imagine? Two million of them building the pyramids and other things. Two million of them were called to be, uh, leave Egypt and go with Moses to the promised land. So Moses, 40 years old, he shows up and uh, it didn't go good. And he murdered a guy and it all got sideways. And God sent him back into the wilderness for like a 40-year reload. So he shows up back again when he's 80 which should encourage some of you, um, because I see some people here, you know, you're getting close to your last lap. <laughs> oh, calm down, I have no hair, gray hair, I get it. I can say that, I can say that. Isn't it, it's never too late to serve the Lord, say it. <laughs> Moses is in square one at 80. That should be good news for somebody here, it's not too late to get your life where God wants it to be. And so at 80, he shows up and he says to Pharaoh, yeah, well, you're, Pharaoh's the king of Egypt. You're going to be uh, letting two million people that all come with me. God told me I need to take them all so you don't have no more slaves. They're all come with me. And Pharaoh's like, I don't think so. Well, you better do it. It's going to get ugly. And he's, I'm not doing it. And uh, I'm quoting here directly from the message, if you have that translation. And, and 
So he says, um, get out, I'm not doing it, and, you know, exchange. Then, um, so Moses brings it down on him, big time, uh, plagues. How many, do you know how many? Ten plagues. Okay, call out the freakiest one. Frogs, correct. That's the correct answer. I can now tell you that 40 cities across America agree that frogs is the freakiest. But there was, there was 10 of them, actually. And, you know, water to blood and darkness and boils and locusts and flies. And, but by far, by far the worst was the death of the firstborn. And when the death of the firstborn came, a pharaoh was crumpled. And he's like, get out! And so Moses is like, come on. And he takes two million people, and they're going from Egypt to the promised land, and um, they're walking, 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 walking. And then the chariots come out, because the, and they, they wake up, and they're like, we got to go get them. And so chariots coming, walking, walking, chariots. How's that going to end? Not good. And they're walking up to the Red Sea. So do you know about this part? How the sea opens in front of them? And the sea opened right in front of them. And they went across on dry land. They came out. The sea closes in and drowns all their enemies. I mean, it's it's really something. Then he goes out into the wilderness and bread comes from heaven and water from a rock and meat when they demand it from God. It's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff happened. Miracles, 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 miracles in Moses' life. There's a reason I'm telling you this. Miracles all the time. One time Moses uh, was uh, with the people and the ground opened up and swallowed all the cranky rebellious people. That's a gift I've prayed for. <laughs> right? And, I mean, he, had, he, he took a tablet and held it while the finger of God wrote the Ten Commandments on it. I mean, the, the, see... Miracles, miracles, miracles all the time. And people look in the Bible, yeah, well, God, God's just not into stuff like that anymore. Really? Is that what you think? Who told you that? And there's reasons why we don't see God rending the heavens and coming down. You're not wrong that there's a barrier. You're just wrong to think that the barrier is God. It isn't. And here you're going to see what it is because while he was up getting the Ten Commandments, his disaster of a brother, Aaron, got afraid because the people were upset. And let me just tell you what Aaron did. So Aaron, don't, please don't laugh at this because it isn't funny. What Aaron did was, was he said to all the people, because they were afraid because Moses was gone, he said, all right, give me all your gold. And he melts down all their gold and makes it into this golden calf. Then the people take off all their clothes and they have a drunken, idolatrous orgy. And then they end by bowing down to this golden calf and saying, you are our gods, you brought us up out of Egypt. Now that gets me to Exodus 32, 9, where it says, and the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people. Now we got to know this church, we got to know this, God sees what happens. God sees what happens at your house. God sees what happens where we work. God sees what happens in this room. He sees into our hearts right now what our attitude is, what our respect for his word is. What the, God sees it all. Everyone say, God sees it. And he says to Moses, I've seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. You know what stiff-necked is? Okay, and again, this isn't to be humorous. Stiff neck is like this. You know? And people do this all the time. And it's as if to say, you don't tell me nothing. I don't need to hear anything from you. I know. Stiff neck. We would say stubborn. Remember that. It's going to come up again in a second. I've seen this people, and behold, it's a stiff-necked people. Now let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them. That's what God thinks of stubbornness, in order that I may make a great nation of you. Moses implored the Lord his God and said, so Moses begins to pray and plead for the Lord not to wipe out the people. And incredibly, in verse 14, the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. Well, once Moses is done pouring out his heart to God for the people he loves, does Moses love the people? Oh, yeah, he loves them. But now he's going to go down and deal with them. Verse 19 says, and as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot. He threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. 
You think this is so great? You think this is better than God? Choke on it! Their idolatry. Then he turns to his brother Aaron. Aaron's so pathetic. Here comes Moses. Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people, they're set on evil. Verse 24, he describes what happened. Aaron says, so I said to them, let any who have gold take it off. So they gave it to me and I threw it into the fire. Out came this calf. Really? Really? Is that what happened? No, what we have here is we have a skill uh, that we've all become uh, too familiar with. It's the ability to twist what's happened in such a way that the responsibilities lies with others and not with me. It's my wife's fault. It's my parents. It's my past. It's my kid. It's my fight. It's my where I come. It's who I. We got stories, stories, stories for why we are the way we are. Moses won't hear any of it. He just steps up. I mean, this is, this, he's leading. Would we even let a pastor in our church lead us this directly? Would we even let that, are we even submissive enough to let someone lead us like that and call us to something better? Moses stands up and says, who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. You can read yourself what happens to the rest of the people. It's serious business, resisting and refusing and rebelling, being stiff-necked. Chapter 33 raises the same theme. Incredibly, God says in 33.3, God says to the children of Israel, go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you. I mean, is there any worse verse in the whole Bible than that? God's like, you go. I'm not going with. Imagine if God said to Harvest Bible Chapel, you go, do whatever you're going to do, I'm not going with. We might as well close the doors. We're just a rotary club with music without God's presence in our church. If God's not working, if God's not moving, if mountains aren't quaking, I'm going to go do something else. All right? This is a God thing. This is a God place. Okay? And, and so, well, why, Lord? Why aren't you going with? He says, lest I consume you on the way. How cavalierly we pray. God, come and meet with us. God, come and show yourself. And here he says, really, with your stubbornness? Because if I show up with all y'all's stubbornness, I'm going to incinerate you. It's my mercy that causes me to hold back and let you get to the end of whatever that is you keep calling church but isn't. Well, Moses, and then notice the reason. He says, lest I consume you on the way. What, what is it, Lord? You're a stiff-necked people. There it is again, twice within just a few verses. What's the problem? What's the problem? You're stubborn. You're just stubborn. Let's don't spend so much time in the Bible that we don't Look in the mirror. And how many of you listening, whatever campus you're on right now, how many of you have been told by a preacher or a small group leader or someone in this church that you need to spend regular faithful time in God's word? You've been told, you know, you need to be in it daily or certainly almost so or you're starving yourself spiritually. You've been told it. But you don't do it because you're stubborn. And how many of you have been told that you don't come into church with unresolved issues with other people? I remember when Pastor Rick preached on, if you're standing at the altar in worship and you remember that you have something against someone, leave your gift, go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your worship. That's what Jesus said. But you don't do it because you're stubborn. And Jesus said, if you will not forgive your brother from your heart, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. But how many people here can call to mind the name of a person, a former business partner, a former spouse, an extended family member, 
a former neighbor or college roommate or somebody, if they came in and sat beside you today, it would make your skin crawl. But you bring that unrighteous, unforgiven resentment and bitterness into God's house and collectively the things that we have not resolved become the barrier that we're asking God to rend. And he's willing to rend it. How many men here have been taught that the emotional nourishment of your wife is your responsibility? You pride yourself on the fact that you're not out running around on your wife, but you sleep with your back to that woman. Well, I'm not unfaithful. Who's more unfaithful? The man out there running around or the guy uh, in the house withholding his heart, closing himself off, causing her to live alone in a marriage. All I'm telling you is both are incredibly unfaithful as husbands, and 1 Peter 3, 7 says, it hinders your prayers. God doesn't listen. Now that's not the first time you've heard that, some of you. But you keep doing it because you're stubborn. And God has so much more for us as a church. You say, well, I just feel like God's not going to save my family. I just feel like God's not going to save me. I've been praying. I, I feel like God's not hearing me. Isaiah 59, 1. The Lord's arm is not short that he cannot save. It's not God. It's not like God, well, I've been trying to get to that. I just can't reach it. His arm's not short. The Lord's arm is not short that he cannot save. I just feel like he's not hearing and his ear is not dull that he cannot hear. Isaiah 59, 2. Your sins, your sins have separated between you and your God. And your iniquities have hidden his face from you. So that he will not hear. You see? Psalm 66, 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And because God has grown this message so much in my heart over these last 60 days... I couldn't just put this on the shelf without sharing my heart for us with the people that we love the most in this whole world. And if we're going to continue to be and be increasingly a place where mountains are quaking and God is rending the heavens and coming down and manifesting his power, we must be the people who do the spiritual business of removing what hinders. And God's spirit is moving toward you now to see those things rended so that the mountains in our lives would quake at his presence. He's not unwilling. He's not reticent. He's willing now. Remember Jesus said, looking over Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks, but you were not willing. And we judge God harshly as though the problem were him. Finally, in verse 14, the Lord says, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And in verse 15, Moses says, well, if your presence isn't going to go with us, we might as well not even go up from here. And then the verse that we love so much. For how shall it be known that we have found favor in your sight? Is it not in your going with us that we are distinct as a people? I don't care about vertical church. I sure don't care about James McDonald. And I wouldn't give you a nickel for the name Harvest Bible Chapel. The distinguishing fingerprint on the life of this fellowship of Jesus followers has to be his going with us. Is it not in your going with us that we are distinct as a people? I and yours from every other people on the face of the earth. Our one value proposition as a church is God shows up here. God works here. He inhabits the praise of his people, and when his son is adored, he rends the heavens and comes down. And when his people come in with their hearts right and their hands clean and their hearts pure, and and his son is adored and his word is proclaimed and he's petitioned fervently by faith, he he just rends the heavens and comes down. And once you've had a taste of that, nothing else will do. Nothing else will do. That's why Moses says here at the end, just show me your glory. Just more of that, please. 
If we have it, we have everything that we need, no matter what we lack. And without it, we have nothing, no matter what we have. Amen? God sealed this message to our hearts. I don't know if I'll ever preach it again, but it must be with us always. This is what we are about. This is why we are here. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, we turn to you in this moment, and we ask, oh, God, that you would, by your spirit, be so specific with us, that you would touch us and convict us about those things that hinder my critical heart, my unbelieving heart, my wayward heart, God, my stubborn heart. I'm a stiff-necked man, and I serve with stiff-necked people who need to hear your word far too often to obey it. Often we have wandered from the path of your truth and regretted it. Never have we stayed and obeyed and found it to be anything less than blessing. Why is there still debate Why is there still resistance? Why are we not running the way of your commandments? Oh, forgive our stubbornness and let your goodness lead to repentance. Lead our church, I pray, into a fresh outpouring of your spirit in the weeks and months ahead that remain in this year. Cause us to come to church prepared as never before, prayed up, right with people in our lives as much as it lies within us, leaning forward with tender hearts, worshiping passionately your great son. And oh, how we pray that the mountains that we're facing in our lives would begin to fall before us, God. Give us a story to tell our kids and our grandkids of how awesome you are. Cause these great, mountains before us to quake at your presence, we pray, and cause us to do everything that we can do to be prepared to receive what you're already willing to do. We submit ourselves afresh to you. We lay our burdens before you, and we just confess, Father, nothing is too hard for you. You are the Lord. Nothing is beyond you. Nothing is out of your reach. You can do it. You can prove it. You can. You're our God, and we trust you, and we love you. You can do it. You can prove it. Yes, you can. Amen? Amen, amen, amen. Amen. Hey, we, we, really, we really care about the burdens that you're carrying. We have folks here, as always, to pray with you, and they would love to just talk to you about whatever's on your heart. Wait a couple of minutes if they're not free, and don't leave today without having somebody pray with you uh, if you're having a burden. And uh, next week, God willing, back into the Gospel of John for many weeks to come, but I'm glad we didn't rush past this. I think this is what God had for us today, and just a punctuation point. This is who we are. This is what we are about. Is it not in his going with us that we are distinct as a people? Amen? Amen. Amen. You are loved. Have a great week.